Would you please stand with us? Well, brothers and sisters, what a joy it is to gather weekly to sing to God our Savior in the presence of one another. And this gathering is a safe space open to anyone who would lay down their burdens and find a rest in the message of Christ Jesus. And here at Sojourn, we begin each of our services with a call to worship. And this is a time where we take the focus off of ourselves and where we ponder the attributes of God. And so as we read, would you join me in the underlying portions? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Amen. Church family, as we begin this time of worship together, may our hearts be open toward God, who rather than making us ascend the mountain to know him, descended to us that we may know his love, his glory, and his faithfulness. Let's respond to this invitation today and worship together. sought us out in tenderness he sought me so we can sick with sin and on his shoulder brought me into his flock again while That's 
Let's read this prayer of confession together. Heavenly Father, the earth is yours and everything in it. Who among us could boast about how hard we have worked without first recognizing that you gave us the means to do so? Who here could count up their most precious blessings without seeing your hand at work? And yet we find ourselves ungrateful. We slowly grow forgetful of how generous you've been to us, how patient, how kind. What have we needed that you have not provided for us? What have we earned that did not first belong to you? What have we accomplished that you did not first set in place? Everything we are and all that we have, our personalities, our thoughts, our bodies, it all belongs to you. With empty hands, we seek your face. Lead us into remembrance because you have done great things for us. Lead us into generosity because you have not withheld any good thing from your children. Lead us into humility because Christ Jesus humbled himself for our sake. Amen. Amen. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. 
church family, as children of the one true and living God, may our generosity never be for generosity's sake, but rather an outpouring of gratitude. As sisters and brothers and co-heirs with the living Christ, may we treat one another as more important than ourselves, because Christ made himself low to raise us from the dead. And as believers, may we find fullness in the teaching, in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, because in him we have been set free from sin. And so would you join us as we sing to Christ in our need of him, in our affection toward him, and in our gratitude for him. Let's continue to worship together.
was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time Sin separated The breach was far too wide From the far side of the chasm You held me in your side You made a way So you made a way Across the great divide He made himself low Left behind heaven's throne To build it here inside And on the cross And there at the cross You paid the debt I owe Broke my chains, freed my soul For the first time I had hope And so we say Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. Took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood. Since we have been raised from the dead with Jesus, we now have peace with God and with one another. As a demonstration of this incredible work, please take a few moments to greet those around you with the peace of Christ.
Well, good morning, Sojourn. My name is Scott. I'm on staff here at East, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to the first day of Daylight Savings 2024. <laughs> How are we feeling today? Yeah. Eh, eh, right, right. So a lot of us are sitting here. We're crabby. We're angry. We don't feel good. Some of you feel guilty because I've seen a couple faces this morning. I know normally go to the nine o'clock service. So you're feeling guilt ridden this morning, but that's okay. There's grace here, right? But this is, uh, this is kind of what Lent is all about, right? To take a full accounting of what it means to be human, who we are as humans, our limitations. And uh, in all seriousness, I, you know, I hope this Lenten season has been memorable or not memorable, but meaningful for you, but maybe memorable. There might be some key insights that you'll want to remember for years. But the point of Lent that we try to drive home, it's a season of preparation. And to do that, we've commissioned some articles by people here at church, people that are sitting around you this morning, to take a particular psalm and meditate on that and share that with you in prayer and in word so that it can help us prepare one another uh, for Easter Sunday. Because Easter isn't just the day where we put on a, a suit and tie and wear our best dress and maybe invite Grandma and Uncle Ed to come and hang out with us and then go eat and you know, race out of here so that we can get to Ryan's uh, and get at the head of the line, right? You know, this is a day where we celebrate you know, the most significant event in the history of the universe, where the God of the universe came out of heaven, became human, lived among us, and instead of being celebrated, you know, he didn't get a, a talk show at 11.30 at night and was lauded and written about in the New York Times, but he was mocked and humiliated and murdered and lay in a grave for three days. And then when he rose, you know, we were able to be reconciled to the living God. And that's a pretty, pretty amazing event. And that's something that we can all get excited about. Amen? Amen. So three weeks from now, we're going to be sitting here and we will be dressed up and we'll probably be in our normal spots unless we get here late. And then who knows where you'll be sitting. Uh, you know, good luck. But as we prepare for that day, for that significant day, there's a couple of things that you can do to help us get ready for Easter Sunday, 2024. The first one is to pray, okay? There's a lot that happens here every Sunday at Sojourn East, from the, the band and the preaching and a different person normally than me announces. We got the people back here in the booth and all the different ministries, Sojourn kids and ushers and greeters. Those are all volunteers. Those are people who do this for free, who don't have to do it. They could sleep in if they wanted to, but they're here. Pray for them. Pray for what happens here so that when that special person that you invite, the experience that they have here is they see that there's something here that's like a tonic to their soul where they're like, man, whatever these people have, I want some of that. So if you could pray for what's going to take place here on Easter Sunday, that would be very, very meaningful. The second thing that you can help out with is if you're a member or a regular attender, if you're committed to this church, consider serving. Because so many people do come on Easter Sunday, we'll be parking out in the grass and the gravel here. You know, those volunteers that I was just going on about, how great they are, we don't have enough of them to go around on Easter Sunday, folks. So we got to step in. we got to pitch in like a family. You know, Lindsay McGar talks about, uses that analogy. You know, company's coming. So we all got to pitch in and help and get everything cleaned up and presentable so that the house isn't a mess when everybody shows up to have dinner with us. So it's kind of that same idea. So if you would consider helping, I've made it super easy for you. If you look in your bulletin, there's a QR code underneath the, the Easter banner. Take a picture of it with your smartphone. A form's going to pop up. Fill out the form. It'll take about a minute. And you could do it right now, or you could do it when you're in line at Ryan's after church. And by the time you get to the head of the line, you'll feel like you should get an extra dessert or an extra portion because you know you're doing a good thing on Easter Sunday in three weeks. So if you could do that, that would be awesome. That would really help us. Uh, to be able to be more hospitable and to make room for the people who are going to be here uh, on that day. Thank you. So I've got one other thing that I want to share with you today. I've been made an honorary member of the Global Pancake Squad. And what that means is I've got to come up here and I've got to hawk pancakes that are happening down here after the service today. So uh, down in the chapel, uh, our missions team and a bunch of volunteers and people like you and me who are going to be going to the DR and going to Spain this summer they're selling pancakes to raise money for these trips. So if you're sitting here going, what's the DR? Okay, you, you need to go down to the pancake breakfast and find one of the people with these shirts and engage them and have a conversation. 
And they're going to tell you about the Dominican Republic and what's going to be going on there with S2 this summer. And it's going to be awesome. So every nickel that's raised down here today, and it's on a donation basis, you pay whatever you want. You can pay $5 or you can pay 50 or 100 you know, I'm just suggesting. Uh, but it'll go for a very, very good cause, and, and it would be really good. And it's turned in, last year it was amazing, and hopefully this year it'll even be more amazing than it was last year. So prayerfully consider that. And if there's anything else at church here that you're interested in, you want to find out about, head over to the website at sojournees.com slash what's happening, and you'll have all that information at your fingertips. All right, at this point in our service each week, this is where we kind of slow it down a little bit. We downshift, and we pause to reflect on God's great generosity. So think about the fact that all of us here in this room, there's about 300, 350 of us here. It's not an accident that we're here, right? This wasn't some random act of the universe. This is nothing short of a miracle that we're all here together this morning. And it's a miracle of God's love and generosity that we're here. And that's what we're doing is we're responding to that, that thing that kind of pulled us in here like the tractor beam in Star Wars. Uh, you know, even some of us against our will maybe this morning. But we reflect on that, and when we do, the outpouring of that is some small imitation of God's generosity through our own. And that comes through service, like what I was just talking about on, on Easter Sunday, helping out a little bit there. But it also comes through the giving of our finances, giving a portion of that to the church to fuel the many things that we're doing here to try to invite people in to the fullness of life that Jesus offers. So if you're a member or a regular attender at church, this calls for you. Uh, if you're visiting with us this morning and you're getting a little uncomfortable, it's okay. We're not after your money. We hope that this service is a blessing for you today. Our scripture reading this morning, it comes from Luke 16, verses 1 through 13. And if you uh, are able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and he asked him, what's this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you can't be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, oh, what shall I do now? My master has taken away my job and I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So, he called in each of his master's debtors, and he asked the first one, How much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, the man said. The manager told him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. And then he asked the second, And how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told that one, Take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. And for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you'll be welcome into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little can also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Peace be with you. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you're visiting with us today, my name is Kevin and I serve as the lead pastor here. And I want to know that we're really grateful that you have joined us this morning. Before we get into this fascinating parable of Jesus, I would like to pray and I invite you to pray with me. Father, you're a good God and you haven't left us to our own devices here, but you've, you've given us your son, you've given us your word. And so I pray this morning as we come to this passage that you would give us eyes to see the truth it contains, that you would give us hearts that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't turn into stones when there's things in here that might really challenge us or pierce us, but instead you'd give us a receptivity, make us receptive to the work of your spirit among us. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. 
I got to tell you, I love this parable. It's one of my favorites. Uh, but it's one that, that has challenged Christians throughout the years. And I know uh, Scott just read it for us. Let me just retell it rather quickly so that we understand exactly what is happening here. It's a story about a wealthy man who discovers that his asset manager has been misappropriating funds. So he calls him in and he terminates him on the spot. And he says, I want you to go balance the books and then bring them back to me. And the man, you know, these are smaller communities back then. He knows that his reputation's shot and he's not going to be able to find a job being a bookkeeper anywhere else after this. And he also knows he's too old uh, to dig and too proud to beg. So he, he feels the gravity of this moment. He's losing his job. He better do something. And then he has a light bulb go off in his head. And he calls in, sets up appointments with all of his boss's debtors. The first one comes in and he says, hey, how much, he's looking at his ledger, how much do you have in, in debt to my master? Like, what do you have down? And the first one says, I have 900 gallons of olive oil. That's a, an incredible amount of olive oil, right? It's three years wages. And... It's like 900. Huh, because down here it says you only have 450. You know, gives him a wink. Oh, okay. Next guy, how much do you owe my master? What is it, 1,000 bushels of wheat? It's like, huh, that's 10 years' wages. He says, it seems there's been an accounting error in your favor because all I have written down is 800 bushels. Of wheat, And we're, we're given the impression that he just continues down the list of all of his, his boss's debtors, hoping and assuming that when he does get terminated and he's out on the street, all of a sudden he's got some people that he has made friends with. And that if he is in need, he'll be able to call them because they will remember the favors he had done for them. Well, it's not long before word of his actions get back to his boss, and this is where the story takes such an unexpected turn. Because the boss doesn't say, how dare you, and berate him. Nor does the boss call the authorities and press charges. Instead, the boss praises the man. This has really confused Christians over the years. Uh, And some people try to come up with these explanations. Well, actually, he was, what he was forgiving in the debts was his own commission, uh, but that doesn't make sense. There are such drastically, such drastic different amounts. Others say, well, it was the unfair finance charges that the master was charging, and he was, he was getting rid of them. That doesn't make sense either, because in the parable, after he does all these things, Jesus says, no, he's a dishonest manager. Like, <laughs> he doesn't say, you know, he's, he's dishonest. And so we read this, and th- this guy is shady as can be, and yet Jesus says, I want you in a way to become more like him. What's he getting at? We've got to pay close attention to verse 8. The master doesn't commend the manager for ripping him off. The master commends him for the way he did it. The master doesn't commend him for being dishonest, but instead the master commended him, it says, because he had acted shrewdly. Now, shrewdness is not something we talk about a lot. We don't, we don't use that word often in our conversation, but shrewdness is a combination of intelligence and foresight, ingenuity, and resourcefulness. It's like having these, th- this ability to like know what's coming and stay a few moves ahead. So if you think in literature, movies, like classic examples would be Sherlock uh, Sherlock Holmes is a shrewd person. Hermione Granger's shrewd. Tony Stark, Iron Man, you know, Katniss, Everdeen. These are all these shrewd characters who are able to kind of see what was coming and prepare themselves, respond accordingly. And what Jesus says in the second half of verse 8, and he's talking to his disciples here, and that's really important. He's not talking to the Pharisees or to tax collectors. It's his disciples. He says to them, the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. 
The people of this world are more shrewd, more resourceful and creative and clever and tenacious in pursuing things of this world, success or promotions, than are the people of the light at pursuing the things of God is what Jesus is saying. He's commenting on the fact that here on earth, when there are material things that we want, we can be very creative and tenacious in pursuing it, but we don't always bring that same creativity and tenacity to our spiritual lives and spiritual pursuits. You know, as human beings, when there's something we want, we tend to find a way to get it, do we not? When I was talking with my wife this week, we were laughing, in 2007, we, we were about three years into our marriage, and we were in the beginning stages of planting a church in Ohio, and we were completely broke. I mean, we were dirt poor. Uh, we lived in a very small 900 square foot house, which was wonderful, but it was tiny. And our church plant, we needed someone who could lead worship. And so we hired my friend Jonas H., who's actually now the uh, lead pastor of Sojourn New Albany, to be our worship leader. I think we paid him like $300 a month. Um, and part of the package is he was allowed to live in the spare bedroom in our 900 square foot house uh, to be young and dumb and not realize the consequences of decisions. It's God's grace that Joan and I are still good friends to this day. Um, but it was during that time that the first iPhone was announced. And we watched, you know, the unveiling. And for both of us, it was love at first sight. It was like this this changes everything. But it also cost $500. Like how, we don't have $500. Like that might've been, that was back when $500 was a lot of money, you know? Like it's a joke on inflation. Um, <laughs> like it was a lot, it was like $500, that was like a mortgage payment. Um, and so you know what we did? We started figuring it out. Sold some things on eBay. Went through our list of books. Like which ones do I not really care? Sold them on Amazon. I literally, my wife came in one time and I'm like in the couch, like I'm not exaggerating, going through collecting the coins because back then people used to carry real money around and I was like collecting it all. And she was like, you are shameless. And I was like, I, we have to get it. We, we got to get it. And I'm like, we'll eat nothing but canned food for the next month if that's what it takes. And so on the day it was released, two guys whose combined income was at the poverty line walked into an Apple store and walked out with two brand new first gen iPhones. It was foolish, absolutely ridiculous looking back. I'm like, what were we thinking? But it proves my point that when we really want something as human beings, we, we tend to find a way. And what Jesus is saying is while we hustle and scheme in pursuit of earthly things, when it comes to the things of God, the people of God often slip into what I would call a, like a pious passivity. And what I mean is like, well, I'm gonna, I want to obey Jesus and I want to believe in him and I want to read his word, all good things. But then we kind of stop there because we think that's the essence of discipleship. And Jesus wants to challenge that. He wants us to think deeply and creatively about how we can leverage what we have for his kingdom purposes. Our time, our vocations, our intelligence, our trainings, our, our connections, our relationships, and especially in this parable, our money. How can we leverage it, get creative with it for kingdom purposes? That's the meaning of verse nine. He says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Use what you have here for my kingdom. And it, just to be clear, because it is a little confusing, Jesus is not saying you can buy your way into heaven here. What he's saying is you can leverage your wealth in light of the future that he is bringing. He wants us to, to live the entirety of our lives before his face, including how we use what we have. And I mean, that's, that's the mission that we're driving for here at Sojourn East. Our mission is to guide people under the fullness of life that Jesus offers. We don't want you to just believe certain things or attend certain things. We want you to bring the entirety of who you are before God and let God transform you and grow you and deepen you. And 
That being said, we all have different gifts and resources. And so this creative, shrewd way of stewarding what we have, it's going to look different for all of us, which means I can't really offer like seven steps to shrewd stewardship. Uh, but, but what I can do is zoom out, look at the text and say, okay, what in here, how does what's in here kind of train our minds and our thinking to become shrewd stewards? And I got three things I want to highlight. The first one, this parable, it, it encourages us to remember the brevity of life. You know, once you understand, you like get over the kind of moral qualms you have, the parable itself is actually quite simple. A man gets a glimpse into his future and it changes how he lives in the present. He gets a window into what's coming and then he adjusts accordingly. I mean, imagine if tomorrow you are going through your inbox and you find you've accidentally been CC'd on an email from your boss or supervisor that was not meant for you that contained a list of employees who were going to be laid off at the end of this upcoming week. As you're going through, you find out your name's on the list, which is a real bummer because you love your job, you feel like you're good at it, but you also know if your name's on this list and it's gone out to, like, you're done. Put yourself in that position. My guess is, after seeing your name on the list, you wouldn't continue to go about your day like business as usual. Like that, that piece of information about what is coming for you would radically change how you live out your day tomorrow. You would make calls to friends and business contacts. You'd update your LinkedIn profile. You might get into the family budget and start saying, okay, what cuts can we make? What cuts can we not make? You know, if we could only get a glimpse into our future, it would radically change how we live in the present. And what Jesus is saying here is that we can know what the future holds for us. Because a day of reckoning is coming. When like this manager, we too, we're going to lose not just our jobs, but we're going to lose everything we hold dear. We're going to lose our homes, our wealth, our possessions. We're going to lose everything down to the beat and our heart and the breath and our lungs. Because everything that we have on this earth is on loan from God. And one day he is going to collect it all back from us. And on that day, we're going to have to stand before him and give an account for how we stewarded all of these gifts that he's given us. And I know we live in a culture that does not want to talk about or think about death that doesn't want to think about our mortality. But Jesus is saying, if you want to be wise and shrewd, wisdom comes not from neglecting reality, but from acknowledging it and then adjusting according to it. And Jesus says, the reality of our mortality and the reality of a day of reckoning should shape and reshape how we think about and handle money. Jesus told a number of parables about money. Every single one, you know what they all had in common? The theme of judgment. We looked at one a few months ago, Luke 12, when we were earlier in Luke, about a rich man who has an incredible harvest and he's got way more crops than he knows what to do with. And instead of saying, hey, how could I help people? He says, oh, I know I'm gonna build bigger barns and then I won't have to think about money again. And Jesus says, you're a fool. Judgment's coming tonight. You're going to die. Think about the parable of the talents. If people are given talents and they're expected to do something with them. And how does the parable end? The master who entrusted the talents to his servants comes back and asks them to give an account. Think about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, which Pastor Jonathan is going to do a wonderful job preaching on next week. It's a very challenging parable. It's actually the, the other side. It's after the judgment has occurred in light of how wealth was stewarded. Why? Why is Jesus, 
always connecting money and judgment. It's, I'll tell you, it's not to try to scare you into giving more money to the church. Because it's not who Jesus is. It's Jesus saying, friends, I know how this all ends. I have a purpose that I am achieving in this world. And I want your life and your stewardship to align with the future reality that I am bringing. And so number one, if we're going to be shrewd stewards, we've got to remember that life is a loner and everything in it. And it's short. And that should give us perspective on how we think about stuff. So remember the brevity of life. The second thing we can draw from this text is to recognize both the limits and the possibility of money. The limits and the possibilities. What do I mean? Verse 9. Read it again. I tell you, use, he says, worldly wealth. Some of your translations might say unrighteous wealth. He's not talking about money that you got through, you know, shady dealings. He's actually just talking about money. And he calls it worldly and unrighteous, not because it's, it's sinful, but because it's a part of the order of this fallen world at this present time. In the new heavens and the new earth, there will not be money. Money is a necessity that emerged out of the fall because we live in a fallen world. And so Jesus says it's, it's worldly, and then he also says it's fleeting because he says he doesn't say, like, if it goes, if your wealth someday goes. He says, when it goes. And from Jesus' perspective, and again, this is littered throughout his teachings, whenever he talks about money, he kind of makes it clear that from his vantage point, there aren't really any good material investments here on earth. And the reason why is because this world in its present state is passing away. And if you think about it, Every material thing, every object that we buy, at some point is eventually going to end up in the dirt. Like everything. Landfill. Or maybe a, you know, recycling plant in China or something. But eventually it's going to find its way into the dirt. That doesn't mean material things are bad. It doesn't mean we shouldn't enjoy the gifts of life. What it does mean is we should have some perspective that material things are not a great investment. Their worth is quite limited. And so you hear Jesus saying this, like money, it's limited, it's like a necessity in this world. It seems like he's got this really low view of money, but then he says that there's actually a way we can leverage our wealth here on earth to gain friends who will welcome us into eternal dwellings. And there's, there's no ex- exact agreement on who these friends are. Uh, angels, God, other believers, people in heaven. No one knows exactly what Jesus is saying here, except for him, it seems like. But it doesn't really change the point. The point Jesus is making is there is a way we can use our perishable wealth, our perishable money here. There is a way to invest it that we can reap eternal, imperishable rewards. That we can actually like funnel it through something in which the money we spend here on earth is actually, the way we use it here is going to have an impact on eternity. How? In a world where everything is perishing, what, what will last forever? Class, anyone? People people that were created in the image of God. People that God sent his son into the world not to condemn, but to rescue and to save. We live forever. That's the claim of the Bible. And therefore, if we want to make good investments with our wealth, the only really good lasting investment is an investment into other people. And Jesus, he's inviting us to leverage our wealth for the help of, to help and to serve others according to his purposes. He's not just calling us to be generous for generosity's sake. 
He's not calling us to throw money away. He's calling us to invest in people. And this should kind of reshape how we think about all of the calls he makes because Jesus' teachings on money are tough. But this is what he's getting at. Everything else is fleeting. doesn't mean it's bad. It's just not a great investment. Well, how do we invest in people? There's two big categories in the Bible. The first is the poor. Those who struggle to cover their basic needs. And sadly, just like everything else in our world today, caring for the poor has all of a sudden become a politicized thing. If you read the Bible, it's not a political thing. It's a biblical thing. It's not what my sermon's about, but I'll just give you one. Proverbs 19, 17. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. In Galatians, Paul says, we as God's people are to do good to all people, but we're also called to give special attention to those who belong to the household of faith. And so we can invest, leverage our money in meeting physical needs for all people, especially for Christians who are living in poverty. Now, there are ministries like Compassion International that do that. Very worthwhile investment. So the first category is the poor. And the second category is the poor in spirit. And the poor in spirit is all of us who are born into a world of sin, who choose sin and who struggle with sin and and who are in need of a savior. Jesus says, you can leverage your wealth to support and advance his mission in which he rescues us from our sin and from the kingdom of darkness and he delivers us into the kingdom of light. And so practically this looks like giving to healthy churches that preach the gospel and help people grow in spiritual maturity. This means giving to missionaries who are traversing the globe to share the gospel with people who've never heard. This means investing in ministries that serve specific people groups like crisis pregnancy centers or ministries to prisoners or campus ministries. But Jesus, he doesn't want to just like give some money and like check the box and say, I did it. He wants us to actually be very thoughtful and creative. How can I best invest some of the money that he's entrusted to me to reach people? And I know talking about money in church is always a tricky thing. If you're visiting here with us, I can promise you, we can get a loud amen. I haven't preached a sermon on money in years, probably. If anything, like, I'm so sensitive to not want to badger people for money. And that's, like, so rooted in my story. My dad did not like Christians or the church. And he always would say, you know, all the church wants is to, like, beg you for money. And so he's been gone for years, but I'm still like trying to prove him wrong. Like, that's not what we are about, dad. Um, And so one area is you can talk about it too much and like beat people over the head and try to make them feel guilty. And the other area is you can not talk about it enough. And that's probably my tendency because really God doesn't need your money. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And I want that to be abundantly clear, but the truth is your generosity and how you handle money and your relationship with money is really important. Jesus talked about money more than any other topic. And the reason why is, again, it's not because he was broke. It's because he knows how powerful money is. And we know how powerful money can be. And I do want you to invest in the work that we're doing here. I believe in what we're doing here deeply. You know, the challenge in a big church is you can, you can oftentimes miss the trees for the forest. You kind of see the big thing that's happening on Sunday and like that was good or that sermon wasn't great or whatever it is. But, but it's easy to miss just because there's too many people to, to actually know everyone. All of the ways that God moves in our church every single day, the lives that are changed, the people who cross over from death to life, the people whose marriages have been struggling for years and they reach out for help and they get a new vision for their marriage and for their family, which will change an entire family and generation. And there are many of you who give very generously to the church. 
And I want to say thank you. Like it means a lot. And we, we try to steward it wisely. And there are others of you who don't give. You've never really considered it. And I just want to say, would you think about it? Would you consider investing here? And investing in what we're doing? Here, what we're trying to do is what Jesus encourages, that leveraging this fleeting, perishable wealth, investing it in such a way that it, it will give us an imperishable return. And yet, I know generosity can be difficult, and that leads to the last and final point. Like, how do we become generous people who do leverage our wealth? Third point, final point from the text is we need to entrust ourselves to the better master. Here's what I mean. 1613, Jesus says, no servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. But you cannot serve both God and money. This is one of the stronger state statements Jesus ever makes about money. You can't serve both God and money. But the word translated money there in other translations is probably, if, if you have like the King James, it's actually the word mammon. Anyone ever heard that word mammon before? So in the New Testament, money is a morally neutral thing. Money is the paper, the coins, you know, the, the, the objects that enable us to exchange goods and services. It's not evil, it's not good, it's just a tool. But mammon is different. The etymology of mammon means to put your trust in. And Jesus, when he talks about mammon, he often personifies mammon into a master or a ruler or even a god. And so when Jesus says you can't serve both God and money, he's saying you can't actually put your, your ultimate trust in both God and money. And you certainly can't serve both because there are times that that money is going to ask you to do or not do things that God is going to call you to do or not do. It's a little confusing, sorry. Or God's going to call you to do some things that if, if you are serving the master of money, you're not going to do. He's not saying you're not allowed to serve them both. He's saying it's impossible. Like they're going in different directions. And the temptation we have is to serve mammon. And the reason why, I don't think it's so much because we all are just greedy and want to spend all of our money on ourselves. There's sometimes, it's true for some of us, and it's, it's probably part of it, but I think so much of, of the reason we, we have such a troubled relationship with money is because it's really about trust and about safety. And I don't think I'm saying anything like controversial here, we all feel better the more money we have in the bank. And the less money you have in the bank, the more anxious you feel. And the Bible's clear, it's as nuanced, it's, it's appropriate to save. Proverbs celebrate someone who leaves an inheritance for their children. But it's also true that, that we buy into the lie that if we just had a little bit more, then we would be safe. If we had just a little bit more money, then everything would be okay. And then we'll be generous, right? And then we'll start, like once I've, I've got myself safe, then I'll start leveraging my money for God's kingdom. And that's when it becomes clear that we're not serving God, we're serving mammon. Because mammon, it always says you always just need a little bit more. You know, the raise you're going to get this year, then things are going to be fine. But it's never enough. And we all know, I don't think this is controversial either, that when we serve the God of mammon, it does bad things to our souls. In contrast to when serving God, the fruit of the Spirit emerges, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, these wonderful Christ-like attributes. When we serve mammon, the fruit of mammon emerges in our life, right? It's greed, anxiety, unrest, envy, Jealousy, despair. You see, we think it'll make it safe, but, but it can't do that. 
Because in the end, money, money is powerful. It can do a lot of things. You know, one thing I can't do is stop death or overcome death. But Jesus Christ did overcome death. And he overcame death to bring us into life with God. While mammon demands that you give your life in pursuit of it, you know, you overwork, you neglect your spouse, your children, you work until you're utterly exhausted. Jesus Christ, he's the one who gave his life for you. And he says, come to me, all you who are labor or weary, and you'll find rest. He says, take my yoke upon you. He's not saying there's not a yoke or a call. He's saying, I'm inviting you into a radically different way of being in the world. One that is not, you know, characterized by just driving for more and accumulating more, but is instead, it begins and ends from a place of trust in the goodness of God, who did not spare his own son, and has promised to give us all things. And we know that in him, even though we're going to die, we're going to live forever. And when you know that, like when you know that you are safe in his kingdom and you are loved by God, you know what money becomes then? Money. A tool that you can use, you can leverage for something so much greater. Now, I think we've covered death, we've covered money, any other topics, you know, that people are hoping we would talk about at church today. Uh, the last one I would say is, is greed in the Bible. It's a, it's a notoriously difficult thing to see in yourself, according to Jesus. Like, we think greedy people are those who drive nicer cars and live in nicer houses than us. Like, that's how we as human beings operate. The truth is, you can be really wealthy and not be greedy, and you can be very poor and be incredibly greedy. How do we know? How do we know if greed's something we really struggle with? Well, I'll give you, I'll give you one test. Like, one sure sign that you're serving mammon rather than God is that you're un unable to give away money. You're unable to be generous. And this is just logical. Like, because if you can't give money away, that signifies that to give money away would be to betray what you value most. It doesn't make any sense. Like, if that's your goal in life, why would you give it away? Everything else serves that goal. Conversely, one of the undeniable signs that, that money is not your master, that money really is a tool, is when you're able to give it away and give it away sacrificially. Because when you freely and give something, you freely give something away, whatever that is, it obviously has no hold on you. You might like the thing, but it's also like I'll survive without it. It's a good test. It's challenging. It's challenging for me. And when we come to these difficult passages of Scripture, I'm always grateful that we end at the table together. <laughs> because who among us doesn't struggle with greed at some level. Who among us doesn't struggle with envy or materialism? And that's where we remember that our salvation, it's not, it's not something we, we work up in ourselves. It's something that God secured on our behalf. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. And then he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant of my blood that is shed for you. And he said, I want you to do this in, remem in remembrance of me. That the Christian faith begins with the generosity of God who created us. And when we were dead in our sins, gave his son to save us. And we come to this table knowing that God's love for us, it's not something that we earn or achieve or maintain. It's something we receive because love is who God is. And so if you are here and you're a Christian, I encourage you to take part in this meal, to be reminded of the generosity of our God, who's promised to make all things new and who is inviting us to take part in that work. If you're here and you're not a Christian, we ask that you not take part in this meal, but instead you take part in the life with God, the fullness of life that Jesus offers. Let's pray. Father, it's the perspective you have is very different than the one we have. 
and the perspective you have is so much better and so much truer than the one we have. But it can be hard. It can be hard to receive. We're busy. We've got so many responsibilities and obligations and duties and whatnot. And so I pray this morning that your spirit would impress, impress upon us ultimate truth and ultimate reality so that we might reorder our lives again and again towards that reality for the good of ourselves and our neighbors and our world and for your glory. We ask these things in your son's name.
Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. Faithful you are, faithful forever you will be, faithful you are, all your promises are yes and amen, all your Promises are yes and faithful father amen praise god well church family we began this morning with an invitation from the lord a call to worship and we're going to conclude with a benediction a blessing spoken over you as you go if you'd like to receive this blessing i invite you to open your arms with me church family go now back into the busyness of the world with your hearts overflowing with peace knowing that in the generosity of Christ, our past has been redeemed and our future has been secured. 
Go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you.